Hi everyone, I'm Mark, the creator of the AGUI Kotlin SDK, and I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the SDK, what brought me to this point, and then dive into the code a bit. So first, a little bit about me. I have 15 years of mobile development experience, so when I first encountered the AGUI protocol back in May, first thing I noticed was the lack of any kind of a, a mobile SDK. So really doing the Kotlin SDK seemed like the ideal point to dive in and get my hands dirty. And um, it was actually the first thing I worked on even before I did the, uh, the work on the Google Agent Development Kit integration. So why Kotlin? Um, you know, again, I come from the, the Android world, uh, so it seemed like the, you know, the most comfortable area for me to contribute. But uh, yeah, I hadn't really done a you know, Kotlin multi-platform project of this size before, so you know, that aspect of it was new. But uh, yeah, I figured it would be a good application for Kotlin multi-platform. It should uh, hopefully give the you know, give the protocol both an Android and an iOS SDK, as well as uh, as well as a JVM desktop, if uh, if anyone wants to use that, and it's able to do that with really a you know just a really high degree of code reuse. So about eighty-five to ninety percent or so of the code, as you'll see, is all is all common. But it also gives uh, native developers who want to uh, retain the look and feel of their native platform the option for for doing that. And it yeah, has a number. Beyond the multi-platform features, it has a number of features that are just uh, kind of uh, well suited for for protocol development. Uh, things like uh, sealed classes and flows. Uh, we'll we'll take a look at those. Um, and uh, yeah, I also wanted to you know, to bring a little uh, little extra value in terms of you know the sample apps and uh, some of the. The features I've put in for uh, for client side tool execution, uh, so we'll take a look at those as well. So yeah, here's the the main Kotlin SDK page in the communities area. Um, getting started guide. It's it's pretty simple. You can use the the AGUI agent class. Um, that's a a stateless agent class. So um, this is if you just want to do some quick queries you don't uh, you don't care about state but then there's also a stateful agent that will retain the message history and um, allow you to use that in your application and to you know if you're working with you know a more llm based agent you know to send the whole the whole history or or a good portion of it uh, down to the down to the agent that you're dealing with so if we take a look at the library first uh, Laid out in just a three basic areas. There's the, the client. This handles the, you know, those uh, the agents that I mentioned, the AGUI agent and the stateful AGUI agent. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff in here. Some chunking handlers, um, various agent builders, uh, some code around uh, state and tools. But really the uh, the bulk of the tool code. I'll get into that in a moment, but that's down here in the tools module. But uh, if you go into the the core module, this this will look familiar if you've worked with um, either the the Python or the TypeScript SDK or any of the other SDKs. But you, you'll find all of your all of your standard types in here. So taking a look at the events, uh, all twenty four, I think. Uh, we're up to 24 events um, in the protocol at the time of this recording, so that includes all of the thinking events. They're all they're all in the protocol uh, as en enums, along with um, the actual concrete uh, data classes for those events. And the the events are a sealed class. Uh, what what this allows us to do, and this is ideal for protocols, is it won't allow any Creative extensions of you know any uh, you know any developer who wants to add their own custom event to the AGUI protocol. I mean we've got a custom event for that, but if they wanted to extend the the you know events prescribed by the protocol, um, they're not going to be able to do that because the the class is sealed. So that allows us to 
write our code with the knowledge that our event handling can be exhaustive and that we aren't going to be hit by some unknown event um, once the once the code gets out into the wild. Um, there's also the all the types are here, the various message types, and the you know, the classes that you you need for dealing with those. Um, and then there's the, you know, this is, uh, you know, an extension um, that we've we've done in the uh, Kotlin SDK. And this is uh, just little assistance to the, to the application developer if they want to use client-side tools. So we've implemented a tool registry where you can, you can register various tool executors. And, you know, these just um, contain a very, very simple protocol, um, you, know, ex, you know, the usual things you would see in a, in a tool, you know, success and failure callbacks, an execution context, and, and then the, the executor itself. So we'll, we'll take a look at, uh, and once we get to the sample app, but, uh, how we can use this to implement a, a very basic tool. Um, another feature of uh, Kotlin that really comes in handy for working with protocols is uh, the Kotlin flows. So uh, yeah, we we use these in our in our agent. So the, the chat can emit a flow. And another handy use of flows is uh, you know similar to what what exists in the TypeScript protocol. We've we've done a, a verify events flow. So this Basically, if everything's running smoothly, it just functions as a pass through. So you get the flow in and the flow out. Um, but what's going on inside is, you know, validating that the that the message, the event flow that you're receiving is is following the protocol. So um, yeah, I cribbed this from TypeScript, but you know, this basically takes a look at the the event coming in, uh, validates it based on the current state, and then if it's in violation throws an error but if it's not a violation then it's just it's just basically a, a pass through as you can see here um, so let's talk a little bit about the platform independence so and, and how that works and we'll we'll take a look at you know a real basic use of that and that's just in the the fact that each one of the platforms to support HTTP they each need their own their own HTTP implementation so if we look at the common level, we'll see there is a, this capability to create a platform HTTP client. So what you'll see in the in the common code, so this is you know all of the the bulk of the code in the library is written to be entirely common, entirely platform independent. So if you look in the in the common code, you'll see this expect function. So this, this basically just tells the, the platform independent portion of the code, there's going to be something called a create platform HTTP client. But, you know, it's, you know, you can kind of think of it as sort of like an interface, something is going to implement it. But we don't know what we just know, you know, this is the very simple um, signature for this function, and it's going to give back something called an HTTP client. So if we go to that, um, that's that has a, a a platform independent definition um, in you know, in, in Ktor. You know, Ktor is the the Kotlin uh, networking stack. So they provide implementations of Ktor for all the major platforms. So uh, if we go, for example, to the iOS version, iOS implements, you know, it's got the iOS Ktor client, which is, uses the Darwin engine factory. And if we go to the, the Android version, it's using the Android engine factory. And then the uh, JVM, it just has a, a JVM based implementation. 
So that's how the, the platform independence works. There's another, a few other examples of that. And another platform specific class is the platform class um, that exists in different flavors for each of the different platforms. So there's the, the iOS platform, which uh, really all that's in there is just the, the name of the platform and then the number of processors available on the device, you know, if that becomes important for concurrency. And then there's the Android platform and the, the JVM platform. So just a very, very limited number of, uh, of platform specific classes. You can find those all if you just if you look in the iOS main or JVM main or Kotlin, uh, Kotlin folders inside the inside these these different modules, you'll you'll find the platform specific code pretty easily. And for example, if you look in the in the tool component, there is no uh, platform specific code. This is all entirely common. So great, we've got a library. Um, what are we going to do with it? And that's where the example apps come in. So um, if you go into the examples folder of the SDK, you'll see a basically a variation on a theme of chat apps. So this, these are all fairly, fairly basic chat apps. Um, and this is the, the main one. This one is the one that's truly multi-platform. So this is Everything, the UI, the entire networking stack, this is all written using Kotlin multi-platform. So if we take a look at what that looks like, for example, on the desktop, if you've ever developed anything in Jetpack Compose, this should look familiar, very Jetpack Compose-like, because it is Compose multi-platform. So let's just go ahead and configure an agent here. Leave the rest blank. And our agent should respond. And this is a, just an ADK agent I've had running for about a month or so. Um, it's developed in memory. It knows who I am. Um, I can recall previous conversations. And I can also change the background with the client side tool. And uh, back to the default. And that also exists in flavors for Android. So a version for iOS. So three three basic flavors of an app all look basically familiar if you're if you're on an Android, it probably looks okay. If you're on the JVM, it looks okay. But if on you're on iOS, you're, um, you probably don't want you know something that looks like it's uh, it's Jetpack Compose. So that is why there is a Swift UI version of the demo app. So this this is where you know we can see one of the Real strengths of multi-platform, Kotlin multi-platform, is it it can play well with with Swift. So, um, you know, really, if you look at all of the Swift code here, it's pretty minimal. It's mostly 
In fact, it's entirely UI code. So everything underneath, um, including the all of the persistence for the agent configuration and the basic chat model itself is written in, in Kotlin. So it's strictly UI. And if we run that, We get something that is, um, let's uh, switch out and back in here. It looks like a native iOS app because it is a native iOS app. Um, it's, you know, the everything, but the UI is written in Kotlin, but the UI is, it's Swift UI. Um, you know, in a similar fashion, we can, um, you may have seen on the, on the Android screen there, there's a, another Android app. This is an Android app written in Java, um, using the, uh, it's not Jetpack Compose, this is the old MDC version of, uh, of Android. But again, if we, if we look at the, if we look at the code underneath that, um, this is all, this is all shared. So this is that, that shared logic I was referring to. So everything, the, the chat agent, the chat agent controller, if we wanted to do any kind of authorization, the tool implementation. Here's that that tool I can I was talking about. So you'll you'll find in each of the each of the client apps they each have their own implementation of the background tool executor. So this is the the logic for actually doing the the changing of the background. So that that's um. um so that, that's actually shared and it's in the common main um, and it's you know, the the implementation of, a, of what happens is actually just uh, you know, it's part of observing the the view model as the as the, the background color so yeah this this is the extent of the of the Java code needed again mostly just uh, you know some adapters the, the basic activities but other than that, it's using Kotlin for, for everything else. And the final example I wanted to talk about is the, the Wear OS example. So here again, um, you know, Wear OS, Kotlin, uh, we're able to use pretty much all of the, uh, all of the networking stack um, so again, this, this chat app shared, this is, you know, this is the, the, the same chat app shared that, it, that we saw in the, in the Java version of the, of the chat app. So here, there's even less actual code in here. There's just a, an app, a view model, and an activity, and then a theme. And so, I don't know why you would want to change the background. on your watch this way, but you can, maybe. Perhaps this doesn't work too well on the emulator. Or it's not really an emulator, it's, there we go. Uh, yeah, it's on, on my actual watch, but we're just viewing it, uh, viewing it remotely. So that is about it. Um, yeah, so take a look. Um, you can find me on Discord if you run into any issues or just raise an issue on the on the GitHub because this is this is maintained uh, in the community section of the of the AGY GitHub AGY protocol. Thanks.